here we are. And I am particularly thrilled about sharing together with my colleague Giada the opening keynote speech of the 38th Italian Geographic Congress. And starting from this keynote, this Congress would like to contribute to gender, generation, and geocultural academic community exchange and hopefully encounter. So, welcome to our guests, Kaya Barry and David Bissell. Kaya is an Australian researcher and artist who has moved to Europe very recently. In fact, after having been a researcher and lecturer at Griffith University in Brisbane, Kaya has joined the Department of Culture and Learning at Orborg University in Copenhagen in Denmark. And this was May 2021, just a few months ago. So moving to Europe, Kaya has probably entered the realm she has inquired about for a long time, and namely migration and tourism and their entanglements. So welcome to Europe as well, Kaya. And uh, Kaya is the author of Everyday Practices of Tourist Mobility, that is a book published in 2018 by Routledge. She's also the author of Creative Measure of the Anthropocene, Art, Mobilities and Participatory Geographies that has been published with John Dickin in 2019. She's the editor of the collection on weather, spaces, mobilities and effects together with Maria Brovnik and Tim Edenser that was published in 2020. And she's also currently co-editing the Encyclopedia of Mobilities with Pete Eide and Wei Kang Lin for publication in 2022. She has also published diverse articles on the main human geographic high impact journals that you may have read. And despite her young age, Kaya has already significantly contributed to human geography, stressing the importance of cross-cultural dialogue with the arts, as well as science, and the other social sciences and humanities. Her research can be also seen as a way to demonstrate the capacity of creative and embodied practice to create possibly a more inclusive knowledge space that is so much needed to answer major global challenges, including sustainability, climate change, and social inclusion. Kaya will share this keynote speech on future mobility geographies with her colleague, David Bissell, so I'll now leave the floor to my colleague Jada Petterle to introduce our second guest. Thanks, Chiara. And again, thanks everyone for being here this afternoon and especially to our Italian colleagues and international guests. So needless to say, with Kaya Barry, David Bissell is one of the leading voices of the debate on mobilities, and we are honored to virtually host him today at our Congress. Previously lecturer in human geography at the University of Brighton and at the Australian National University, David Bissell is currently associate professor and Australian Research Council future fellow in the School of Geography at the University of Melbourne. He is also the managing editor of Social and Cultural Geography and sits on the editorial boards of two leading journals in mobility studies like Mobilities and Transfers. David is also the steering committee chair of the AUSMOP, the Australia, Australian Mobilities Research Network. His original voice has been a stable geographical presence in the ongoing debate on mobile lives and subjects, practices and methods. Often through a non-representational register, David explored the effective capacities of the traveling body, interrogating also the nature of power and control in mobility processes. His book, Transit Life, How Commuting is Transforming Our Cities, proposes an exploration of the ways that everyday life in the city is defined by commuting through multiple temporalities, materialities, infrastructures, bodily experience, and effects. David is also the co-editor of the Routledge Handbook of Mobilities, of the book Stillness in a Mobile World, and of the recent collection ne Negative Geographies, Exploring the Politics of Limits. As a cultural geographer, he explored a variety of case studies from Australia to Japan, Canada, and the UK, combining qualitative research on embodied practices with social theory to show the social, political, and ethical implications of the mobile lives of commuters 
passengers, and mobile workers. So to conclude, as Kaya's and David's researches show, mobilities and immobilities are embedded with affective, bodily, and subjective, but also aesthetic, political, social, and ethical meanings. During the COVID-19 crisis, ideas relating with mobility and immobility, of course, have forced us to reimagine both our future geographies and the future of geography as a discipline. Questioning the ways in which the world will move challenges our key geographical concepts and future agenda. So this keynote speech on future mobile geographies will help us prompting questions about how we, as a community of geographers, could collectively respond to a series of crises and to move beyond them. So Kaya and David, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for having us. Um, to begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we both work on Indigenous country in Australia, and we'd like to pay our respects to the elders of the Wurundjeri, the Yagara, and the Turrbal peoples, past, present, and future. So thank you so much to the conference organizers for inviting us. Um, it's a real honor and we're both really excited to share our thinking with you today. Um, we'd like to congratulate the organizers on convening such an exciting event, especially given the challenges of being online. Um, so thank you. Um, the program looks really fantastic and it's a testament to both the breadth and quality of cutting edge geographical research taking place in Italy, of which we hope to learn much more about. Um, and it's also been very fun for us to prepare a joint keynote presentation. And we've enjoyed discussing this between us over the past few months. So uh, to begin, we'd like to start with an image. So grounded planes, deserted airports, empty trams. These are just some of the dominant images of our current time, at least in countries like Australia, where multiple lockdowns have become the exhaustingly familiar time signature of the past 18 months. The COVID-19 pandemic has immobilized flows at a range of different scales. From the perspective of global freight logistics and passenger flows, last March, international travel dramatically slowed as countries slammed their borders shut and demand for travel plummeted. But of course, at a smaller spatial scale, the COVID-19 pandemic has immobilized many of our everyday urban and regional flows as working from home continues to be the new normal for many around the world. Now, of any discipline, it's surely geographers who are best placed to speak to this new socio-spatial situation of restriction, containment, and immobility. So supplementing vital public health and medical research responses to COVID-19 we think that geographical research is urgently required to help us to make sense of the socio-spatial transformations that are currently taking place. And yet what is taking place will take some time to figure out. For though we're 18 months into this global pandemic, surely what's also palpable is a sense of groundlessness too, of disorientation and of not being quite sure what's going on or perhaps even how to feel. Again, such problems are profoundly geographical because they're all about our affective and emotional spatial relations, our orientations to place. And yet, maybe far from disabling, such confusions might also be profoundly enabling. Maybe they might allow new senses to emerge, new forms to take shape, and new questions to be asked. So in our lecture today, we want to share some ideas with you about how geographies and mobility are an essential tool to think through our current situation. So we'll begin by delving into the recent past of the discipline of geography to explain how mobility's thinking has evolved in the past few decades. And we'll draw out some provocations for geographies of our present. In turn, Kaya and I will then share how we have both developed these agendas in our current work. Firstly, Kaya will turn to geographical aesthetics, uh, and then I will talk about affective immobilities. And then we'll finish by signposting some future directions for geography. 
So uh, to begin, our current zeitgeist of profound immobility brings to the fore how mobilities are the beating heart of our life worlds. Now an established subfield of human geography and evolving into conversations with other disciplines, mobilities is a field that over the past 20 years have re has reached a certain maturity. So in addition to how the pandemic has propelled ideas about mobility to center stage, this is also a brilliant opportunity to take stock and project forward from a disciplinary perspective. We've come so used to mobility being a fact of life for so many. Um, such a contention is underscored so well by John Uri's point that over 200 years ago, people in the US moved an average of only 50 meters per day. Whereas in the early 20th century, they moved over 50 kilometers a day, a staggering increase in how far some of us travel. Responding to the rise of mobility at different times over recent decades, Geographers have been preoccupied with different dimensions of this movement. Early economic geographical work, such as David Harvey's path-breaking work on the intensification of production networks and globalization, stressed that the fact of time-space compression, while humanistic geographers, such as Yi Fu Tan and Edward Ralph, both drew our attention to how movement was giving rise to all kinds of changes in the felt perception of place with Ralph being particularly concerned by how mobility was potentially eroding place specificity. And more recent work in social and cultural geography has countered such pessimism with a more affirmative take on how mobility is absolutely central to what makes places progressive and exciting. So Massey's work, more than most, has consistently pointed to how mobility is enabling and productive of social life rather than the converse while at the same time drawing our critical attention to how people are differently positioned in relation to these flows. And yet reflecting on the past 18 months, COVID-19 has plunged so many of us into a world of crisis immobility. And this is such a different world to the one that mobility geographers have depicted over the past 20 years or so. Our sensing of movement and the scales of movement have been drastically altered. No longer can we find assurance in the assumed boundaries of where normal or habitual mobility takes place or how things that are on the move or relative, come into contact relatively seamlessly with each other. The practices, meanings and affects of mobility seem to have dramatically changed. Because of this, we suggest that now is the time that we need to develop new geographical understandings of mobility and immobility. So where to start? We have decades of really rich geographical resources to draw on. And we also think it's very important to create geographically situated accounts of our new situation that are appreciative of context and conceptual provenance. There is so, so much work, um, potential we think for new ideas about mobility to be generated outside the Anglocentric academic world. And of course, there are some brilliant mobilities work being undertaken by geographers uh, in Italy. For instance, and among many others, Chiara Rabiosi's excellent work on tourist mobilities, Giada Petele's work on narrative mobilities, Laura Lopresti's work on mapping, Dragan Umek's work on migration, and Tania Rosetto's work on embodiment. And of course, this has been bolstered by the brilliant new Mobility and Humanities Center here at Padova. And our hope is that more Italian only writings will be translated to extend their reach. So as a catalyst for new geographical thought, the pandemic prompts new questions about mobility. How is it valued or not? How can we use it as an opportunity to think differently about the future of mobility? How can we develop its pedagogical pretend, uh, potential to unlearn deeply entrenched mobility habits and how might we ask questions about uneven, the uneven hierarchies that mobility produces? And how, much, how might such geographies of immobility offer avenues for doing geographical research differently, especially at a time where Western-centric expectations about research practice uh, often require extensive mobility for field work? That's something we're all struggling with at the moment, I think. <laughs> In terms of our academic practices, we need to change our expectations about 
work-life balance, about mobility and its relation to success narratives, and about mobility and fieldwork expectations. So how do we ensure future geographic research takes mobility seriously to explore the many alternative ways of inhabiting, researching, teaching, and practicing geography? So these are just some of the big picture questions that have framed our thinking. And in the next two parts of our lecture, we want to share with you how we're both developing mobile geographies in our work. So first, I'm delighted to hand over to Kaya. Thanks, David. So um, the past year and a half has radically reshaped our tolerances of proximity, of distance, and of our sense of how we inhabit and move through places. Attention to cartographic and spatial measures have charted a renewed aesthetics of space in how measures and forecasters are predicted, modeled, plotted, and tracked. The infodemic that the World Health Organization declared shows us how an oversaturation of this crisis communication has overwhelmed us. But this trend of visualizing spatial phenomena was already emerging with other wicked problems from climate modeling, from the measurements of melting sea ice, scales of biodiversity loss, and, and so on. Alongside these communicative devices are highly tuned visual techniques for representing spatial and mobility concerns. So just think about how the practices of social distancing or keeping space have played out in almost all areas of daily life. These are embodied, performative, but also highly visualized forms of spatial and geographical practices that we've become so accustomed to seeing. So as a researcher, I'm interested in geographical aesthetics and in particular, how mobilities are visualized and sensed. Um, I found my way into human geography through the arts. My first degree was in visual arts. And so I see myself as among the growing cohort of geographers who use creativity and arts practice as a central part of their research methods, their conceptual framings and issues of inquiry. But these recent shifts that urge us to confront global issues through very personal, individualized and site-specific instructions and encounters have further emphasized the importance of aesthetics and visualities in geographical inquiry. So some recent mobile shifts in the early days of 2020, I, like many others, watched the city that I was living in, Brisbane, Mianjin, transform into a sea of ad hoc wayfinding signage, arrows and fluorescent tape barriers, all instructing me how to move, where to stand, what to touch, what not to touch each time I stepped outside. There were stickers and markings on footpaths, floors, surfaces of public space that mapped out required measures between people. In Australia, it's 1.5 metres. Elsewhere, it was two metres, sometimes six feet, sometimes less. New forms of wayfinding aesthetics regulate mobility in public areas, marking out where we need to stand, wait, queue, and be patient. So since early last year, I've been documenting with photography, field notes, and artistic sketches and diagrams of these mobilities instructions and these new architectures that have been installed in public spaces. And while I thought at first this was going to be more of a side project, based around my own experiences of where I was moving and travelled um, and the things I was witnessing, it's now amassed to hundreds of sketches and over a thousand photographs to date. But this fits within a long preoccupation I have with mobility diagrams, instructions, and the power of visual methods in articulating complex spatial and temporal maneuvers. So like many geographers who are responding to the pandemic um, in creative ways, there's an importance and urgency for making space for transscalar and transhuman cartographies of experience and expression as described um, in a recent article by Pass et al. While these aesthetic and visual ruminations on these shifts are not intended to be um, a proposal for solutions or how we should communicate better, they, they are, I feel, very important mediations that provoke reconsiderations of the geographic measures that we encounter in daily life. These externalized directives of how and where mobility is permitted 
relies on universal assumptions on the able-bodied mobility and the desired social usages of public space or community areas. And so these new geographic aesthetics attempt to alleviate proximity between people, but at the same time, they create further exclusion and they narrow the definition of what kinds of bodies have the right to be in public space. So um, here where I now live in Copenhagen in Denmark, the threat and the risk has changed, it's less, and the spatial instructions have transformed over summer into a lighthearted tone. Colourful wayfinding signage decorates parks, running tracks, subways and supermarkets. And these cheery summer themed signs, they still feature the hard arrows and the um, hard line stance of mobility, but they're now complemented with cartoons of flowers and ice creams and beach balls, all in pastel tones. So they blend into a touristic landscape of the city that maybe surprisingly is still reinforcing what kinds of desirable interactions may take place. Yet these more friendly signs are still mounted on large reinforced concrete bollards, imposing a brutality on the urban laneways, the shopping streets, the beachscapes that's suggestive of a lingering threat. And so these spatial and behavioral directions are still present and walking in the wrong direction or on the incorrect side of the footpath, it still results in glares from other pedestrians passing by or from ticket offices at a metro station. And then um, at the global stage, we're seeing color-coded international travel advisories where nation states pit each other's vaccine successes and surpluses against each other. Traffic light systems facilitate a color spectrum from the good, the green, to the bad, the red, handling of the pandemic that serves to universalize the mobilities of risky travelers. But these kinds of colorful aesthetics have long been embedded in border controls, in travel cultures, and of course, in everyday forms of mobility too. But we see on the news, this gradual reopening of borders that's being celebrated. We see flights of vaccines arriving in far off lands, the resumption of tourism crowds in cities and circular migration schemes of new people coming in. And these visualities show us that the geographics, uh, the, that the ge geographies of mobilities are highly aestheticized, they're charged and they're likely to generate even more uneven and inequitable assumptions about who should be on the move. So meanwhile, on the planetary scale of events, our landscapes, seas and skies are transforming in equally pressing yet highly aestheticized ways. New ecological aesthetics are emerging as we grapple with the Anthropocene and the warming climate. Heat waves see temperature records fall, weather forecasts are having to change color scales to address more higher temperature extremes. Ecological distress from drought, heat and other climate extremes see non-human life suffer and wither on our doorsteps. Rainfall in the Arctic shows Greenland melting and we see a flood of glacial blue-green hues fill the front pages of news media, news media websites. And this is alongside the intense reds, oranges and hazy pinks of the wildfires that are ravaging places we never thought would burn. So speaking from my own experience of the 2019 bushfires in Australia, we had months of smoke and ash filling the horizon. Masks, hospital masks, were being worn in some places to protect oneself from this ecological distress. The dust and ash was unbearable to breathe in. And this was months, like six months before the pandemic had begun. In protest events where school children took to the streets to demand change, the masks were donned as a visual emblem of the need for climate action. The hazy sunsets transformed the twilight skies. There were glorious blood red suns and moons. And so this photo you can see here, it was taken while I was at a small cultural geography workshop, which we had all flown into from all across the continent to attend. And I, like many others, continued to snap photographs and marvel at these surreal disastrous landscapes. All the while, I still was taking regular flights for work travel. As the fires were burning the landscapes below, I could watch on from above in awe. 
So the air pollution from the fires was so dense, it broke new global records. It gave textures to the skies. We saw maps like this, where in early 2020, the smoke from the fires on the eastern coast of Australia completed a lap around the globe. And emergency weather warning signs had to be updated to fit with these new extreme, extreme events. New signage sprung up all over the Australian landscape cautioning how to behave in relation to wild things and places. So signs to say, leave water out for wildlife, to report smoke scents or sightings, um, do not smoke cigarettes near trees and so on. And then a few months later, a new kind of renewed attention to nature was forced upon us. Appreciate, appreciating nature on our doorsteps, noticing seasonal changes, gardening patches and balcony planters, bird watching and listening to the rhythms of non-humans during the quiet periods in our cities. This return to nature that we heralded as some kind of way of switching off glorified this natural aesthetic, which was a welcome relief. But the aesthetics of ecological crisis are being painted on still with a really broad brushstroke. And we need to be mindful of how and why these particular visualities come to soothe, alleviate, or often moments of care in our disrupted mobile lives. So our presence and proximity along non-humans at all scales, it now pervades our orientations of being with and in the world. And Searle et al. described this spatio-temporal event as a sense of being in the middle of things at a turning point, they say. But following Roy, they suggest that this is also a portal to reconfiguring the scale of humanity in both everyday and geological terms. And so here I'm attempting to highlight these two scales or these two framings of shifting mobility aesthetics from the individual's place in a human scale crisis, the pandemic, to the planetary scales of change that we are being oversaturated with. So where do we go with these aesthetic geographies? Negotiating these new geographical aesthetics is a complex, contextual and emotional task. Such magnification of our geographies, both large and small, highlight the multiplicity of measures that are needed to sense, listen and align with what lays ahead in even greater crisis to come. We can see the building tensions of trying to live with these changes and to be comfortable with new levels of uncertainty. But at the same time, there's still an encouragement of this self-surveillant public that's being cultivated, where new cartographies are performed at a range of personal, collective, social and ecological scales. And so while there is a tendency to quote, see mobility from more broadly as an outcome of emergency or governance, as Peter Aidey cautioned, these responsive actions that we're seeing emerge now will have long-standing implications as these procedures of spatial and mobility governance become accepted and embedded in global societies and in our everyday. Geographers know that defining and demarking space is never neutral, and we must use these opportunities to question how visual and mobile practices need to be closely scrutinized. This aesthetic palette of shifting mobilities, it fits with recent commentary on the creativity and the role of the visual in geography in which Harriet Hawkins describes an increasing call for critical thinking on creative practice relations. The experience of, one, of how one sees, hears and feels their way around the world as these examples I've briefly mentioned illustrate, a part of a growing vocabulary and strength in geography around visualities, aesthetics and mobilities that bring together other ways, non-textual and non-verbal ways of doing geographical research. So these shifting aesthetics of geographies that I've described here are far from the proximal encounters with nature that we had dreamt of as something hopeful to cling on to in the first half of 2020. Imagining an ongoing durational and perhaps even more sinister mode of governing the public space of even bigger crisis and disasters was quite hard to fathom as we gazed out our windows at the greenery and nature we were longing to escape into. 
So while these socio-spatial impacts of the pandemic are becoming well-rehearsed research terrain, um, I hope that this discussion of aesthetic approaches offers possibilities for thinking what these new ge visual geographies of mobility may mean and how we encounter and perform them as we head into other kinds of slower emergencies. So now um, I'll hand over to David. Thanks so much, Kaya, that was fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm gonna take some of these themes of mobili mobility and embodiment in a, in a slightly different direction but I think it complements a lot of what Kai has already said. So in Melbourne, Nam, I've been exploring how mobile workers have become essential workers during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially during times of lockdown. Like in many other parts of the world, truck drivers ensure that supermarket shelves are full, delivery riders on bikes and mopeds bring cooked meals to people's front doors. COVID-19 seems to have intensified a new mobile power geometry, as Doreen Massey might say, but one where to be still is to be in a position of relative power, directing the mobilities of others who are at the mercy of infrastructures and increasingly technology platforms. And these mobile others are at much higher risk of exposure, of course, to COVID-19. So my research in the gig economy and how it's changed during COVID-19 continues my broader interest in mobilities and work futures in an era of technological change. Like my research on commuting and distance labour, I'm interested in people who are experiencing situations of constraint and debility because of movement. So commuters squeezed by long journeys to and from work, families who are alienated by one family member working away from home, often for long periods of time. And as I've just mentioned, gig workers at the mercy of platforms. So these are all in different ways, new mobile subjects that are required to be mobile for their livelihoods. So these are people that are moved by larger forces, though of course, configurations of willing movement and being moved are not of course clear cut as Tim Cresswell's work on the politics of mobility um, brilliantly highlights. Now geographers have given lots of attention to exploring, uh, I guess, macro level mobilities. So the displacements of people. Uh, so we know a lot about where people move from and to how often that movement takes place and what mode of transport people take. But I think much less has been said about the kinds of intensive micro mobilities of these displacements. And what I mean by that is that rather than focusing on people's relatively determ determinate identities uh, and transport choices, so the things that we can kind of fix, mo micro mobilities are all about how being in movement changes people's indeterminate capacities to both do things and to feel things. So their capacities to affect and be affected. And this is important because as Hayden Lorimer puts it, social fabrics and practices are not locked into rational or predictable logics and are often visceral and instinctive. So like Kaya's research, conceptually, this perspective I think is incredibly useful for supplementing political economy insights into broad macro level mobilities with attention to performance, affect, and sensation of micro-level mobilities. So these theories that foreground the significance of bodily evaluations help us to understand the role of bodily experience in a much more transitional, open-ended way, appreciating that what bodies can do and what they can feel does not stay fixed, but changes in relation to what we do, and crucially, how we move. So for instance, my previous work on commuting tried to emphasize that it's only through events and encounters that our capacities change. And what this means is that all the environments that we move through impress on us and leave their mark. Some environments might increase some capacities while reducing others. And of course, our own presence changes the world as well. So inspired by recent work uh, on habit in cultural geography, uh, what we experience becomes part of who we are, and who we are comes to be part of the environments that we move through. So the significance of this is that mobilities, 
and of course mobility infrastructures, far from just transporting us, are actively changing us. Now, methodologically, I've been really interested in exploring how different traveling environments change people's capacities for affecting and being affected. Now, in contrast to the spaces that have traditionally been the focus of geographical analysis, my focus is on a series of interstitial transient environments. Things like this picture here, vehicle interiors, train carriages, airport lounges, taxi ranks. However, in my view, these are not what Marc Auger famously described as non-places, traveling spaces that in his view are devoid of sociality or history. Quite the converse, transient places are where we work on our sense of selves and negotiate our socio-spatial relations. And also like Kaya, I've been really inspired by new ways of doing geographical field work that foregrounds changing capacities. So creative approaches that permit new ways of sensing and feeling the transitions in powers in the life worlds of others. So treating interviews, for example, like observant participation, to use Nigel Thrift's term, to attend to the affectivity of fieldwork encounters. My fieldwork involves encounters with mobile workers. So in my recent project, I've been interviewing gig workers as well as platform consumers, so people like each of us perhaps, to explore how the on-demand economy is changing urban mobilities intensively. So changing configurations of pleasure and sorrow in the city as well as learning about the everyday pragmatics that these jobs entail, in addition to the various strategies and tactics that people develop to cope with these potentially depleting lives, I've been paying close attention to the way that these jobs are talked about. So from the point of view of changing indeterminate capacities, I've been interested in how people's relationships to their mobile work is shaped in part through the telling of stories during field work encounters. Now, mobility's geographers have written a lot about mobility from the, sorry, about immobility from the perspective of bodily displacements or lack of, of people being stilled and immobilized in place. However, I've, I've recently become really interested in a slightly different sort of immobility that has received less attention, but one I think that seems to have perhaps been heightened as a result of COVID-19. And I'm calling it here, uh, affective immobility. So a situation where people are unmoved from the perspective of bodily feeling. So think about how during the pandemic, especially many of us have developed certain ways of stopping affective mobility, stopping depleting situations from affecting us. So we might have developed all kinds of ways of numbing or anesthetizing painful sensations. I've drunk way too many glasses of wine, I have to say. <laughs> For me, it was my field work with gig workers, such as food delivery riders, where this focus on affective immobility has come from. So where other researchers have highlighted how mobile gig workers are very present time oriented, you know, dwelling in the present, many of my interviews indicate quite a different disposition at work, where storytelling works to displace them from the immediacy of their gig work situation. Now, such interview moments were always subtle, but just about palpable. So through insinuations such as concealment, projection, resignation, my interviews with mobile gig workers suggested a situation of people not quite inhabiting the present. And this is really interesting, I think, because Heidegger and Tim Ingold's development of Heidegger's ideas about how practical tasks immerse us into a kind of dwelling in situ, you know, where what we do sort of puts us in, in place, um, seems to be at odds with these more eccentric or oblique forms of dwelling ex situ, dwelling elsewhere that these workers gestured to. So thinking through experiences of dwelling ex situ, of distancing, of being unmoved, I think complicates some of our most cherished touch points in geography over the past couple of decades defined as they are by a commitment to treating relationships, connections as primary. So how we're immersed, how we're caught in the middle of things. In our collective focus on 
connecting the dots, on tracing attachments, joining the threads, we've created an image of a body that's thoroughly immersed in practice. Now, during different periods since the cultural turn in geography, the kinds of spatial metaphors that have surged to prominence reflect this body image. So we're very used to hearing words like hybridity, blurring, fluidity, porosity. So through these sorts of conceptual supports, I think there's very little space for imagining the sorts of distancing, the sorts of gaps that mobile workers were inviting me to think of. Now, some geographers have noticed their, noted their dissatisfaction with these ideas of hybridity and have turned to more temporally dynamic theories that emphasize how our relations with things change. And they've expressed this through concepts such as thresholds or phase changes, as Paul Simpson and James Ash's work has shown. And yet such theories still seem to prioritize connectivity and process at the expense of disconnection, of separation, and ultimately immobility. And this is a point that's collectively made by the authors of an upcoming edited collection on negative geographies, edited by Mitch Rose, Paul Harrison, and myself. So for me taken together, relational geographies that emphasize connectivity don't admit the kinds of immaterial disconnections that were palpable in the interviews that I did with gig workers. Now, I think what's really curious is that our collective focus on relations and on connections for us as geographers seems also to have led to an overfocus on intensifying capacities for being affected, where becoming attuned to things has become an ethical imperative. So think about how this is the conclusion in so many geography articles in in social and cultural geographies where we and other people just need to pay attention to attune ourselves to the world, to better care for the world. But I think this repeated presumption that being affected by something inevitably leads to valuing that thing and caring for it is misplaced. We see this all the time in reality where we know so much more about the kinds of things going on in the world, but does this necessarily result in us caring for those things more? So my question to you is, are there experiences of valuing and caring that take place through being unmoved, cut off, severed, separated? So thinking back to the gig workers that I interviewed, I think there might be. Now what's significant here is that many critical theories have highlighted the problems of being unmoved, of being unaffected. And we can trace a line here that runs from earlier work on the intensification of urban stimuli through Georg Simmel and Walter Benjamin's writings, through to more recent work by Franco Berardi that warn of the dangers of anesthesia, of sensory depletion, of being unmoved, the outcome of which is ultimately impotent subjectivities. However, in contrast to this dominant strand, thinkers of performance have recently written about how being unmoved, unaffected, might be thought of more affirmatively, more positively, as a survival tactic in an overwhelming world. And it's these thinkers that have helped me most in responding to the interviews that I did with gig workers to understand just how perhaps they were protecting themselves. So Lauren Ballant, through her concept of unfeeling, offers, I think, one of the most helpful handholds here. Like many of her other concepts that flag the kinds of fugitive agency available in even the most constrained situation, being unmoved is a strange kind of capacity, a quiet refusal to feel, and a form of dwelling that doesn't dovetail with the feeling of being present. So where Ballant focuses on the protective capacity of affective immobilities. Other thinkers are a bit more explicit about what they do. So Zine Yao encourages us to consider disaffection to be the unfeeling rupture that enables new structures of feeling to arise. She's very positive about this. And Rita Felsky similarly points to how being unaffected can actually create all kinds of other ties. So stepping back, the politics of my mobility's research is firmly about advocating for mobility justice, to use Mimi Scheller's term. However, for me, we have a responsibility to reveal the myriad hidden injustices that fly under the radar of more political economy accounts. 
Through our research with gig workers, our project team has compiled tactics that workers have found helpful. And in my previous work with long distance mobile workers, we've shared such tactics with others through short animations directed towards current and prospective, uh, prospective mobile workers. We've also produced reports that call out institutional responsibilities. And yet in this impact driven agenda that the neoliberal academy increasingly demands, I'm also left uncomfortable about the essentializing that this pragmatism risks. So strategic essentialism can often be effective in some circumstances, but this seems to go against the indeterminacy of the theories of performativity that I'm inspired by. And yet I'm also equally nervous about geographical theories that overemphasize people's powers, that overemphasize the salvation of supplemental powers that can be mustered, that can be brought up in even the most constrained situation. So you know, there are so many geographers that want to point to the tactics that people use to get by. And I accept that that's partly what I'm doing here. So cultural geographers inspired by process theories, especially through the affirmative philosophies of say Deleuze and Guattari have shown us a world of infinite potential. And this may well be the case. And yet such redemptive theorization, such a hopeful investment in trusting that transformation will and is indeed taking place, is surely naive too, because such theories don't adequately account for limits. So limits not as roadblocks to be got over, to be transcended, but as irreconcilable limits that thread our life worlds. I appreciate this is a hard tightrope to walk, but it's why in an era of loss in the wake of COVID-19 and the kinds of crises that Kaya spoke of, we need new geographical theories that account for the role of limits, of immobilities, in all their affirmative and critical complexities. Thank you, David. Um, so to close then, um, we hope that you'll agree that mobile geographies are perfectly placed to investigate and intervene in the new configurations of power that are arising in this long tail of COVID-19. These are new configurations of power that are made at, that are made all the more complicated when we consider how the crisis of the pandemic folds into other crises that we're experiencing simultaneously, especially the climate crisis. So where power has traditionally been theorized by geographers along state and institutional axes, unpacking the various disciplinary techniques and modes through which people and places have been governed through our presentation today, we've tried to explain how a cultural geographical perspective that foregrounds mobility, embodiment and affectivity supplements these ways of thinking about power along new lines, both how power is being twisted, but also how bodies might also respond in all kinds of unforeseen ways. For geographies of mobility, this means that while it's vital to think about the way that mobility is being differently governed through the macro politics of state policies and practices, we also need to think about the micro politics of mobility in terms of how people are moved and made to feel in different ways. Crucially, we've suggesting that at the level of embodiment, this micro politics of mobility is much more indeterminate, much more open because how bodies make sense of and feel through or don't feel, our new situation of immobility is still open to change. As Kaya's research has shown, such theories can be folded back to thinking about how governance happens as much through aesthetic and sensory registers as it does through symbolic and discursive registers. And as my research suggests, such theories can be used to think about how people manage their capacities to, uh, to be affected, manage their capacities to feel. So as a way of managing and responding to the multiple crises we find ourselves in, we want to emphasize that it's not just the management of physical immobility that is taking place, but affective immobility too, through the various ways that discomforts might be blocked and anesthetized by ourselves and others. So in short, we hope that you will agree with us that now is the perfect time for geographers to investigate the richness and complexity of future mobile geographies, to develop new ways of understanding our changing relationships to mobility, both physically and affectively, 
to champion new ways of seeking mobility justice. I thank you so much for your, once again, for your very, very kind invitation to present our lecture at your conference and also for making us feel so very welcome. And we're really excited about hearing your comments and questions. Thank you.